I can hear you. Yeah. But my camera is gone. Uh, uh so I'm speaking. Oh, now you, yeah, it's quite, okay. it's, it's good. Okay, so let me do the introduction. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this uh, week's uh, 3D GV seminar. Uh, seminar. To, uh, we is our great pleasure to have a uh, uh, professor, Doctor Hao Li. Uh, he is at uh, Prince Print Screen. Like uh, he's a CEO of Print Screen. Um, uh, how I have uh, known how for more than fifteen years, and so he he was a uh, um, um, uh, Associate uh, Professor at the USC. He has won many awards, including MIT TR35, Omar Young uh, Investigator Award, and many, many best paper awards. He has, uh, uh, he has uh, done a lot of works, right, at the intersection of uh, geometry processing, 3D vision, graphics, and and today he was going to talk about AI synthesis from avatars to 3D scenes. Let's welcome. Thank you so much, Peter. Um, yeah, it's, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a great honor to be uh, speaking at the 3D GV seminar. Um, so what I'd like to um, do today is talk a little bit about some of the things that we're working recently. Um, so as you already mentioned, I work on a bunch of stuff in the past. Uh, on geometry processing, and then we did all the stuff together with, uh, you know, going from graphics to computer vision. And uh, just like many of the people who are in this community right now, we're uh, heavily exploring, um, you know, the use of deep neural networks to go beyond just, you know, classifying objects, but uh, doing uh, really interesting things like um, synthesis, right? So how do we uh, replace rendering? How do we um, also, how do we combine these kind of techniques with differentiable rendering to um, improve the modeling process and to make it more automatic? And just like most of the research I've done in the past, I think, um, you know, I've always been really um, motivated by, uh, you know, working on digital humans, right? So that's sort of like one of the central things that I've been working on. And some of the key applications that I'm really passionate about is obviously content creation uh, as a graphic scientist and also um, specifically on communication, right? How do, we, um, how do we create a world where we can have immersive communication? So one of the <clears throat> things that, you know, more recently, you know, we've been all wondering is how can we go beyond this kind of, this form of, uh, you know, giving talks where we can't really see each other and, um, you know, something that the, pan the pandemic has shown us is that, you know, we're kind of like still stuck in this uh, 2D video conferencing room, right? Um, and one of the thoughts here that, you know, many researchers have been working for quite a while is, can we have, can we have remote communication or interaction in a way that, um, you know, it feels like we're in the same place and everything feels a lot more immersive. So one of the videos that I'm going to show you right now, um, this one is created by uh, Microsoft. It's a concept video for HoloLens 2. And I think it's a really nice illustration how um, you know, people are envisioning how we're going to potentially interact in the, in the near future where <clears throat> you know, we're basically in arbitrary places, right? So there's no more the constraint of being, um, you know, physically at a specific place so we can all remotely interact at any time, uh, any place we want. Um, and one of the things that you see here is that um, the immersive display basically allows us to see each other in 3D. But um, one of the core things here is that you can see that there is a virtual person that appears out of nowhere. So it looks like a form of teleportation. Um, if you look a little further, you'll also see um, the character here on the left, uh, which is sort of like this, <clears throat> you know, video game character of another person, right? And so these are sort of like two types of virtual humans that, uh, you know, people in our field are exploring, right? So the first one is this typical video game character that we call parametric models. And the other one is this volumetric capture of a person that's teleporting from one place to another. So if we think about that, um, there are a couple of problems here, right? So first of all, how easy is it to create a 
personalized avatar game character that looks like you, that is represent, representative of yourself. And the other problem is when you're doing this volumetric capture of the other person, how are you capturing that person, right? So that person most likely, uh, given the technology we have today, is probably inside a studio where you can actually see um, each other. Oh, I can see Etienne. Hello, Etienne. <laughs> Good to see you. So one of the things that we're already seeing here is, um, you know, many um, people in industry all starting to work on uh, these type of problems. So this, this is like a work that has been going on for a couple of years. Uh, this is a work from Facebook Reality Lab. So they call it Avatar Codec. And uh, one of the things that they're showing here is that um, you can have a modified uh, virtual reality headset that allows you to interact in real time with another person, right? So this could potentially be a killer app because imagine if I'm wearing this headset right now, I can actually feel like the other person is in the same place, right? And one of the things that we see here is that um, it's really nice because they're using a new form of rendering uh, that is called neural rendering, right? It's basically going, stepping a little bit away from the standard computer graphics pipeline where you have 3D models and textures. Um, but what you see here is that they're using a deep neural network to actually generate something that looks like a video, right? So in order to produce that, um, they would use like a you know 360 capture environment, record a bunch of data, build this into a model, and then use um, various camera sensors that are placed on the Oculus to infer the facial expression in real time. So this is something that's very exciting about using digital humans. Furthermore, another thing that I'm um, also very passionate about is the problem of what if it's not about creating a digital human where um, that is representative of ourselves, where it's about human-human interaction, but what if it's another machine? Can we have an AI or chatbot that has a human-like form, right? So this is something that has a lot of applications uh, in our everyday lives, right? So um, some studies are basically showing that most of the customer interactions are actually already going to be handled without human agents by the end of this year, right? So this means that you go on some websites, you're chatting to, a, you're um, having conversation with a chatbot, you're calling your doctor and you know no one's really responding, but you have like an auto response machine. You're, you're in your car, you're asking to turn on the volume, you're actually talking to a voice. So in many situations, it's actually really helpful to actually have a human form, a human-like representation of a digital agent to create that, right? So this is an example of a company called Soul Machine, which is specialized on creating virtual assistants. And um, one of the concepts that you know, Samsung was showing is that you can also create um, you know, photoreal uh, virtual avatars using a neural rendering uh, engine for the face, right? So this is a project that was called Samsung Man and um, it was showcased, I think, uh, one or two years ago at CS. And one of the things that they were showing here is maybe this is the way that people uh, can have a more natural conversation when, for example, you're buying a ticket to, uh, to get on the train, et cetera, right? And we can think beyond, right? Just having, you know, a fun human-like interface. Uh, we can also think, we have to think a little bit what is going to become the future of, you know, human machine interaction, right? Or human human interaction. And one of the things that a lot of people are talking about these days is the metaverse, right? So, and what is the metaverse? At least for now, to me, it sounds more like a uh, massive uh, multiplayer online game uh, where people have the ability to interact, think of something like Second Life. But one thing that the pandemic is showing is that um, the life event industry is also something that has been hit by this, right? It might recover, but people during that time have seen an acceleration of virtualization of different experiences and different ways to consume entertainment. And um, one of the things that we're seeing here is that people are exploring, in, are indeed exploring uh, video game engines um, uh, or uh, gaming platforms uh, to basically host live concerts, for instance, right? So you had, um, you know, you know, um, you know, uh, Ariana Grande, or you have all these different celebrities that are um, that are basically exploring how can we create a 
virtual form of themselves and having them throw, you know, a rap concert or uh, any kind of or a pop concert, right? And um, <clears throat> they have shown that you can actually have something that you can't do in real life, that you can have tens of thousands uh, uh, of, um, you know, viewers that life can actually see that person. Um, and this could potent these numbers could potentially go way up, right? Another thing that we're also seeing is uh, the use of humans that actually aren't even impersonating real ones, but completely virtual ones, right? So this is also something that's very hot uh, right now in the uh, NFT space, right? So where you basically have, you know, virtual influencers that are on social media, um, not only promoting real brands, but also selling virtual items, right? So this is an area where people are exploring how can you create like a trading ecosystem with things that actually don't even exist. So why am I showing you all these different examples? First of all, um, one of the core things here is that we're trying to, while we're trying to virtualize a lot of the things that we're consuming in our society, at the center of it is ourselves, right? We're trying to digitize, digitize ourselves. We're even being entertained by, um, you know, virtual humans that actually don't even exist. And so this is sort of like a, sort of like a sci-fi future that we're sort of like building. And um, one of the things that are central to this is that everything is going to be 3D. So we can't just be restricted to, you know, video content. So 3D is important because um, I believe that, you know, AR devices, we will be able to witness another wave where, um, we're going to see how they're going to become more uh, consumer ready, right? So right now there's still hardware limitations, but I think um, there's still going to be a time that will come probably in the next five to 10 years where um, we'll have uh, more accessible devices for people. So anything that's related to virtual humans, I think there are three central areas that are uh, really important. One is in communication because we're trying to represent ourselves and enable the ability to for us to communicate with each other. The other one is, I think the most natural way for us to interact with a machine is if we interact with something that's human, something that actually understands us, right? This is really how I see the future of interaction is. And the third thing is the most obvious, which is, well, any virtual content we try to create uh, most likely has a form of virtual human. So what is the problem here, right? So the problem for creating virtual humans is, as we've known in the past, there's something that are, it's something that's very difficult to achieve, something that, uh, you know, that prevents us from having this so-called uncanny valley effect, something that, um, you know, requires a lot of manual work and is very expensive and time consuming to produce. We've seen virtual humans through various um, uh, advancements, uh, especially in uh, the visual effects industry, where people have basically perfected the creation of visual humans, but it's a very expensive thing, right? So you need, you know, large studios with a lot of people developing all these different techniques. But if you think about it, one of the main problems is that everyone is using the standard computer graphics pipeline, whether it's offline rendering with global illumination, et cetera. The main problem is that you have, you're using many different technologies trying to put everything together inside a pipeline and um, all of them can only work with each other if you have very skilled digital artists and very patient ones that can um, you know, tweak all the parameters for everything to look right. So to give you an example, um, even with you know, the best um, clothing simulations that you have nowadays, um, these models are based on you know, models that um, computer scientists have uh, defined, right? So they're simplification of how reality works. So what, you, what it means is that you do have this iteration of, let me put some values, see what comes out, and then try to um, rerun the whole system and see if it gets better, right? So this is the thing that slows down everything, right? Not to mention the amount of computation that is required for the level of resolution that is needed to put these things on the screen. But at the same time, um, the real time, um, you know, the real time graphics uh, space is also advancing very fast. So here is 
one of the uh, latest demos from Epic Games. Um, this is a uh, software solution called uh, MetaHuman Creator, right? So uh, they basically um, launched uh, earlier this year a solution that basically allows people to very quickly create a custom form of virtual avatar with high quality assets that came from scans um, and uh, you know, various techniques to actually blend them together, right? So what is nice about this is that you can show that you can create quite uh, convincing characters, much more superior than what you see in typical games, and um, integrate, incorporate them inside a um, game engine that can be run in real time, right? So um, a lot of you know life events, live shows are starting to explore how we can use these kind of things instead of real humans. Um, but still, you still have the problem that if you want to digitize yourself, someone that looks exactly like you, uh, is still something that you can't really achieve easily with the system, right? So the reason is that this system allows you to create a plausible human, but not the one where you have the likeness. And <clears throat> that's one problem. The second problem is that um, the type of performance, uh, hardware performance that is required to run uh, this kind of, uh, you know, uh, rendering is still very involved. So probably in the very near future, we won't be seeing uh, uh, massive multiplayer online games where you have this level of fidelity in there, right? Uh, one thing that is really important is that the shading and rendering and lighting is really important uh, to get to the quality that we see here. That's one of the problems with uh, standard computer graphics as it is today. Nevertheless, um, the, when people want to digitize a specific person, let's, let's start with what is the, you know, the way to get the best possible quality, right? So the obvious solution is we scan the person, right? Um, and you know, one of the devices um, you know, I was using a lot when uh, I was directing uh, the uh, USC Institute for Creative Technologies is the light stage device that was invented by Paul DeBerg where you can basically put a person inside this, you know, super um, gigantic device that has, you know, multiple LEDs, you use a method called photo multi-view photometric stereo to basically acquire high quality scan of the person. And what's important here is that we have shown that this is something that has proven to be useful for, you know, high-end production. So you can scan not just like, uh, you know, the, uh, the high resolution geometry of the person, but you can also capture, you know, appearance uh, proper, physically based appearance properties from the person's face using, you know, um, a technique that's based on varying LED, the, the LED lights, right? So by doing so, um, you basically get high quality um, assets that you can actually use inside your pipeline. But one thing that is important to know is that even if you have the best assets out there, it's still a very, very manual process to integrate that either inside a video game or inside a, um, you know, to be used inside a film. And <clears throat> one of the reason here is that a lot of the rendering really depends in the end on what kind of rendering you're using, right? What kind of rendering technique you're using and also on carefully post-processed uh, assets by a team of digital artists. To animate the face, obviously you need to rig the face. If you want to um, create, let's say eyeballs, you need to create a high quality eyeball model that has you know, the proper shader so that you can actually render these things. So what this means is that even if I had a million dollars to buy this device and put it at home, it's still extremely difficult for me to use anything that is being captured here inside some inside a interactive application. It's very difficult to automate this process. So one of the things, one of the motivations for us to actually build Pinscreen, uh, <clears throat> which you know we started uh, back in 2015, is to basically think about well, you know, at some point people are going to be able to interact with each other. People are going to be able to create their own avatars people are going to be able to create their clones, but this cannot be in the form of having a studio that processes the data or a studio that uses heavy equipments, right? To um, digitize the person. 
the only way for us to build something that can be consumer ready and consumer ready means all the applications shown in, in the beginning. Anyone can create an avatar, anyone can create their you know, virtual assistant. It has to be as easy as taking a photo or recording a video from your face because that's the only device that people have. So this is sort of like our grand challenge. How do we create that? And what is the problem? Well, the problem is that first of all, I mean, not to mention you only have one single photo of your face. Um, it's a very, very difficult problem. Um, and um, you need to digitize everything, right? It's not just like a 3D face model. It's not just the texture. It has to be the hair, the body. Uh, it has to know everything that a human can see from the picture, reinterpret that into a 3D avatar that should be as high quality as possible. And one of the other issues is it has to work anywhere, right? Um, it, you can't expect a consumer to go to understand what perfect lighting, what a diffuse lighting condition is. It has to work when someone is, you know, walking on the street, indoor, outdoor, in an office in a really bad lighting condition. It has to work anywhere. So that makes the problem significantly more difficult. So let's talk about 3D avatar synthesis, right? So for 3D avatar synthesis, one of the idea here is that, and you can see that I'm using the word synthesis, is we're literally starting to look into an approach that's about generating. At Pinscreen, we've been exploring all kinds of uh, ways to digitize avatars in the past. We had multiple uh, iterations and multiple uh, innovations in that space. And all of them in the past had some limitations, right? So whether you need to have a good lighting condition to digitize the avatar, or you have to make sure the person doesn't wear glasses, or you have to make sure the face isn't heavily occluded by hair, that's something that you know, we have been focusing on the last two years, right? So let's look at what the prior work does. So probably the most famous uh, work uh, is morphable face models, right? So morphable face models is a linear model that, can, that is built from a database of scans of different subjects and can be enhanced using facial expressions. This is what Thies and uh, coworkers did back in 2016. Um, they've basically shown that you can do this in real time and um, uh, introduced a iterative <clears throat> uh, optimization algorithm based on uh, conjugate gradients um, and combine this with a standard linear 3D multiple face model with expressions to basically digitize the person's face, right? So um, one of the things that you can see here is that the text, both the texture and the geometry actually have uh, are basically linear models, right? So they are basically um, PCA uh, compressions of different uh, samples in real life. Uh, Deng and coworkers actually started to think about, can we you know, not use this iterative optimization because um, it could get stuck easily into local minimas um, if, you are, you know, if you have an input photo that is very, has very challenging lighting conditions. And um, what they're doing is they're saying, let's do the inference using a deep layer network, right? There are actually multiple papers that actually propose this. Um, and more recently, uh, Li et al are basically saying that, well, you know, the texture that I have from the linear 3D MM isn't enough for me to actually capture all the, you know, not only just, you know, facial hair and all these details, but really doesn't blur the face when I'm, doing this linear combination, right? So really having a non-linear form of a 3D multiple face model. So all, the th all these methods are, you know, interesting and you can see the last method performs extremely well. Um, but the problem is that it's baking in all the lighting into it. I can't use this data inside a virtual environment without it looking natural. Because first of all, Beckham is, you know, the input subject Beckham is, smiling. So it's going to give me a hard time doing uh, facial animation. As you can see on the first one, the face has been neutralized, meaning I'm setting all the expression values to zero. Now, <clears throat> if the lighting is baked in, re-illuminating re this inside a um, real-time environment or any virtual environment will have the problem that you'll still have like the specularities on the face. That's not something that is desirable. So we've been looking at different ways 
to see if we can get rid of these things and if we can sort of like neutralize or normalize the, the data, right? Uh, one of the really interesting work from uh, Cole, uh, from who's at Google right now in 2017 <clears throat> is to basically say, well, can we actually generate a face from a unconstrained input video, uh, input photo, right? So you can see uh, the both photos on, um, uh, on the upper part, they have like, you know, significant shadow shading, shadows at black and white. But what if you can actually use a face recognition network to extract, um, you know, facial features of the person that encodes the identity of, of the person? Can you actually train a generator that generates what that person is supposed to be, right? So you have this encoder decoder architecture where the encoder maps the input photo, the unconstrained input photo with all the shading and all the problems into a feature vector that's extracting just the likeness, the identity of the person and regenerates this for that person. So they've been using a linear um, model, uh, morphological face model to basically generate the, the uh, identity of the person. And we can see that it's very, very robust, right? One of the limitations there is that the resolution is still very poor and you can't really get all the details uh, from uh, the subject, right? So what we have done later on is to introduce a method that explicitly neutralizes the input photo so that we can actually have a better way to reconstruct the 3D face model from the person, right? So the idea is that you have an unconstrained photo of a person, let's neutralize its facial expression, let's see if there's a way to normalize the lighting condition and um, even undo the perspective distortion of an unknown camera lens, right? So to some extent, this works uh, quite well. Um, we've actually integrated that in some of our products. But one of the things is that this method doesn't work well when the face is side, uh, very side facing, right? To some extent, we can make the face front facing, but when the face is quite side facing, it still fails. When you have very, very strong lighting, um, changes, right? So if you have like a shadow on the face or if you have specularities, it still doesn't get rid of that. And one of the other problem is that the likeness of the person is sometimes kind of hard to really ensure. So what we started to do is we started to think, can't we just like have an end-to-end -end solution that directly just generates the 3D model, right? So we've been looking at, you know, all the progress in, um, you know, many of them that are done by NVIDIA with, you know, StyleGAN, um, where you can see that, you know, it's possible to take any uh, image and then you can generate high, re high resolution images of people. And we start to think about like, why don't we just do this in 3D, right? Can't we just have a much simpler architecture that isn't that ad hoc, that basically generates the 3D model directly? So, <clears throat> Here's an example of our new method that we actually just presented at CVPR this year. Uh, it's called normalized 3D avatar synthesis. The idea is that given an input photo, what we're trying to do is we're trying to generate directly a 3D, a textured 3D model of that person, but it's in a neutral facial expression and it's also in a normalized lighting condition so that we can actually re-render this in an arbitrary virtual environment. So you can see that guy here has like a very strong light that's shining from a, you know, from a direction, but we're trying to generate a texture that is as diffuse as possible, right? So we can basically um, create models that are a lot more robust, right? And one thing that is really cool here is that the whole appearance in the end is, is very consistent between avatars. So it doesn't, it looks like it's, you know, created for a same application. So what is the challenge here, right? So the challenge here is that obviously people have a lot of different facial expressions and uh, you have a huge amount of lighting conditions and a lot of head poses and glasses. So why is this method difficult to implement? Because it's hard to get data from that. If you were to use a purely supervised uh, learning method, then what you do need is you do need, ideally for every person in the world, you need, uh, you know, this person's face and different facial expression, different lighting conditions, but also 
a three-dimensional model of that person's face in a clean environment. This is possible for maybe hundreds of people that we could capture inside a scan environment. So we can buy, uh, purchase those scan data. But what is very difficult there is that you can't scale this up to like tens of thousands of people. It's just not practical. So that's problem number one. Right? So how do we deal with um, uh, the problem with not having enough data for that? So one of our approaches is basically to generate some of the data using um, synthesis. And uh, the second approach is to actually simplify this problem and divide this problem into two parts. So what we do is we first do a sort of like a 3D style gun approach that generates a 3D model. But then even by augmenting the training data set with a huge amount of training data, we still can't get the likeness of the person perfectly because there's just simply not enough data. So what we do is we say, well, you know what, let's do, let's split this problem into two problems. An inference stage, which has this encoder decoder idea. So we use an encoder that extracts the identity of the person, a decoder that is trained with as much data as we can actually generate and collect. Um, we generate a face of um, the input person. So you can see the textured mesh, the 3D face model and the um, texture. These are directly generated. But what we do is after this step, we take the input photo and transfer the final likeness to uh, that generated, that inferred 3D model using multiple iterations. So the first stage is very fast, right? So it's probably less than a second. But then the inference stage, every uh, iteration probably takes about a second, right? So we need multiple iterations to improve um, the avatar quality. And this final step, we use differentiable rendering for that. So let me show, explain first how the inference stage works. So first of all, uh, for the inference stage, we want to use, we want to extract the identity of the avatar, right? Um, in the original paper, we're using FaceNet, right? So FaceNet is a very powerful um, uh, network that can basic that is used for face recognition, right? So uh, different faces of us, and you take a photo of that person, and it says, well, this is Mark Bennett, this is Howley, this is ATN Google. And uh, you can basically extract that key, right? So this is the feature vector. Now, ideally, I can use that feature vector and just use style again and generate it, but the problem is that they have incompatible um, represent, you know, internal representations. So what we do is we basically plug in sort of like a bridge and call this the identity regressor. So we take the face net and train basically the identity regressor and basically train the whole thing end to end in order to obtain this inference stage, right? So the inference stage basically allows us to generate a 3D avatar directly from that input image. So now you might add, uh, ask yourself, how do I get the 3D model? So to get the 3D model, um, basically, I mean, if you think about StyleGAN, StyleGAN generates a 2D image of a person. And what we do here is we say, instead of a pixel color, it's basically generating XYZ coordinates. So that's the representation. And then the other thing is basically the texture map, which is just generated <clears throat> uh, normally. So we have basically a texture map and then a position map that is being generated, which allows us to basically get a 3D model. The refinement stage, is the differentiable rendering component in this whole uh, thing. So um, <clears throat> basically what we do is we use the latent vector W from StyleGAN, right? We input that into StyleGAN and it generates what I just explained, right? The texture map and the um, uh, position map. And what we do is we take the input photo. What I wanna do now is I wanna, whatever I generate now, I want to improve that based on the input photo. So what I do is I take the input photo, use a PSP net to basically do a semantic segmentation of the face mask. So I'm basically um, extracting a binary mask of the face just to know where is the area I should be focusing on and then use a cl classification network based on ResNet 50, 50 to determine camera parameters, right? 
the camera parameters, or you can also call them head pose, doesn't matter which one you're moving, uh, basically allows me to position the heads uh, to uh, the face mask. Now, if I combine all these things together, um, I can basically put the 3D model that I have inferred using StyleGen2 into, um, uh, I can reposition that into the input photo and, and basically do, I can compare it with it, right? I can compare what is the difference with what I have just generated with the input photo. And because every step here is differentiable, I can basically do back propagation and I can do differentiable rendering. I can basically compute the gradient, which allows me to do to optimize for what is the new latent vector that should go in there to, to be improved. So that's that's pretty much it, right? So you improve this, and then you have this really uh, robust way of digitizing the avatar. Now, instead of showing a video, I'm going to show a live demo of that. And let me uh, switch my gears and go to the other screen. So let's see. So um, I think I'm logged in. And um, here, let me do this first. So I'm going to take our host today, uh, Peter Hong. Yeah, I'm going to take that photo here. This is like a different photo. I'm going to save them. So this is a good photo because it has um, very bad. Well, it's a beautiful picture, but it's very bad for in terms of getting normalized face, right? It's reddish, it has some shadows, and I can try it with you guys later on the webcam as well. Um, so now I've downloaded this. I'm going to um, share my app. Oops. It is because of that guy. Um, so <clears throat> what I'm going to do now is um, upload the photo that I just downloaded. Can you guys see this? Okay. Here, let's take Peter and let's see how it looks like. So after one second, it's actually already inferred. So it already happened. I'm not showing this. Uh, I should be probably doing something to show the, um, uh, the progress. But uh, this is now taking a little bit, right? So it takes like maybe 30, 40, 50 seconds. I don't know. Depends a little bit like how many people are using it. Um, but during that time, what it's doing is that it's refining, right? Uh, it's refining the, uh, the algorithm. The, uh, Model using differentiable rendering. And um, takes a little while. So this is like <laughs> this is the Peter version. Um, and <clears throat> right, so the body, here, so the face here is a, so this is a parametric uh, model. Uh, one of the things that we did, so we can, we can zoom in a bit, right? So you can see, uh, we have like, like, you know, it's actually doing uh, really interesting stuff. It's um, getting, you know, the, eye, you know, details here on eyebrow. It actually doesn't see it, but it's generating it, okay? You can see some of the stubble hair on the mouth. This, these are things that it's imagining from that image, so it's not actually there. Um, but it's basically creating this Peter model from that, uh, from that photo. And um, what's really interesting is that we're also doing differentiable rendering for eyeballs. Um, so you can see that the, it's not just a generic white texture. So it's actually synthesizing um, you know, the color as well. So this basically reduces the problem of the uncanny valley effect. And this is a um, game character that's in Unity that anyone can use. And it's fully parametric. I think I can make you um, say hi. And I can give you some weird expressions on the face. <laughs> and yeah, so. And to illustrate a bit like um, some really extreme examples. Um, um, so here are some, uh, these ones are, these ones are crazy. So. Uh, we, let me just show you one more. So this this guy is really interesting. So he's doing this really, really crazy facial expression, 
and you know, lighting is also poor. But the, the reason why it works is because it's extracting the likeness of the person. Now, this method can still fail, right? So it fails, for example, for um, people that, so like any deep neural network method, if there are some subjects that are really different than the statistical distribution of what's in the training, then you can still get something that looks a little bit out of place, right? So if you have a person with a huge beard, they could fail, right? But um, it really depends. And then, but the, an easy fix is you just add that person back into it, right? So once you add that person, it will, it will fix it immediately, which is kind of like the nice thing about this approach. Cool. Um, happy to show more later, uh, but let me move on with the, uh, with the presentation. Okay, cool. So, all right. So here are a couple of examples uh, that we have shown uh, in the in the paper. So we're actually um, we've actually run we're running this on like hundreds of subjects, like uh, almost a thousand, and uh, we're basically you know sort of like really ensuring that you know the quality improves on a weekly basis. So um, whatever we have now, it's already improved from. Uh, what I what we had in you know uh, these couple of months, and um, <clears throat> here you can see that you know these are really completely different kinds of you know photographs with different um, color corrections, etc. Uh, but it gets like uh, the um, likeness right from the person, right? So um, it works uh, extremely well when <clears throat> the person has a different facial expression. Um, <clears throat> the one on the upper left is also very interesting. You can see it's very side facing uh, from the person and um, also has a very good um, you know, district balance in terms of different ethnicities. And we also show that if you put a painting onto it, uh, you can get you know, what, whatever is the like, most likely thing uh, that is being generated. So in terms of identity consistency, this is the way we evaluate the performance. So we use different people, different Kim Jong-uns at different space and times. And we show that, you know, it gets something similar. It's not perfectly the same person. Uh, it, would be, it would be surprising if it was. And also when we provide a video, if we um, compute for every frame completely independently, we also get a reasonably similar person, right? It's not perfect. But this is actually quite cool because you can see with extremely, um, you know, strong lighting conditions with um, very strong colors, um, it still gets a reasonable skin tone. And the reason for that is because we're basically learning the appearance of the person together with uh, the identity, right? So it's kind of connected. So this is just to compare with whatever is the state of the art right now, which is uh, Lee et al from last year. And you can see that our results are different in the sense that we focus entirely on neutralized and normalized uh, output and not on baked in lighting and expressions. Um, so that was like demo I was showing. Some of the things that we're working on um, in, we're actually working on right now is actually on multiple ends. Uh, one of them is basically creating high fidelity assets. So much higher quality geometries, much higher quality, um, uh, much higher quality textures of the person, but also ones that can be used to easily uh, animate. Um, one other thing that we're actually also working on is not just digitizing the head and the hair, it's digitizing everything from the body, right? So how do we create the body shape and how do we digitize Clothing. So hopefully something I can uh, show you guys uh, in you know the next uh, next presentations. Okay, so we talked about um, you know how do we create these parametric models um, um, from a photo, and uh, we focused on photorealistic ones. But one thing that if you observe when I was animating Peter's face is that whenever he's smiling, it's still a little bit uncanny because there are things that are uh, basically interpreted by the 3D model and the rig. So if you remember, um, I've been working for a couple of years on how do we um, use a GAN network 
to basically generate expressions automatically. Automatically, this is a work that was shown back in 2018, um, where we have an input photo of a person and we can immediately generate dynamic textures of that person based on the performance of another person, right? The method is quite simple. You um, track, the, um, you track the, the facial performance of an input person, transfer the um, animation weights uh, to a model that you have created from that input photo and basically use that as a condition to an image translation network to generate a uh, facial expression of that person. What we've shown is that you can actually generate plausible facial expressions and also render it from different views. And one of the you know, techniques that we have modified over, over time to basically you know, showcase uh, various forms of real-time deep fakes uh, where you can um, you know, illustrate how you can generate very realistic uh, faces of people in real time. But one of our goals is not to create deep fakes. Uh, we're mostly focusing on how do we make virtual humans in the space of entertainment and communication uh, more realistic so that they don't have the you know, typical problem that you have in video games. So what we're doing here is we're trying to use this hybrid approach um, of you have CG characters, but for their faces, we want to have very realistic faces. And um, one of uh, the new methods that we have um, introduced uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, in, in which we won an epic uh, mega grant for, is how do we enhance the Unreal game engine with our pagan solution, right? How can we have a real-time uh, inference of um, you know, CG characters? So you can see on the left, this is a CG character of Mike Seymour. And on the right, you have a real-time neural rendering of his face where the model has been um, trained using five, you know, four or five minutes of uh, video capture of his face. So we're using this technique um, in the context of human digitization, right? How can we create um, virtual content um, of digital humans uh, for real-time application, for real-time virtual production. Um, we've, we have shown that it's you know, easily possible to just use a performance-driven uh, approach to basically drive the phase in real-time as well. And uh, we've already integrated that with some of our partners. Um, for example, with uh, uh, one of the top clothing companies in Japan called Zozo, uh, they're part of Yahoo Japan. So, we're basically uh, showcasing how we can actually replace virtual, uh, replace fashion models with virtual ones, with uh, virtual influencers. And one of the things that we can show is that, you know, now we can actually create very realistic virtual humans and productions of those uh, at scale, right? So this is something that, you know, within a few days we can generate, which previously, if you wanted to get to the quality, would take uh, weeks, if not months. So, I've been, talk, I've been showing various forms of you know, avatars in parametric forms. Um, the other forms that was motiv motivated in the beginning of this presentation is the use of volumetric capture, right? And um, one of the things that is obvious in the space is why can't we just, why do we have to go through, you know, why do we need a parametric model of an avatar and, um, and put that inside a virtual environment for any interactive application. Well, the advantage is that you can relight it and you can author it. But there are times where you do not necessarily need that. Maybe you just want to capture something as it is, just like you're using a video camera, but just in 3D. So Microsoft was also showing this really interesting demo, right? So where they do have an interactive space where people are wearing whole lens again and seeing each other. Um, but one of the things you can see is that Anything that looks really real here are volumetric, real-time volumetric captures of the people that are then inserted inside this uh, virtual environment. So they have shown uh, a couple of years ago with their holoportation system that if you had the equipment, basically multiple real-time depth sensors that are placed around the person inside a capture environment, you can digitize the entire person and fuse the model in real time and potentially use that as a virtual teleportation system. Um, other 
companies like Evercoast are also exploring this. So they're building these low cost capture environments, but still, you still have the issue that, um, you know, it's not very practical. You do need multiple cameras put around the person and, um, you know, in order to see the person from any possible angle. So this is not practical because um, it's unlikely that people are going, I mean, first of all, it's not portable at all, uh, such a system. And the second thing is it's unlikely people are going to have this kind of environment inside uh, their homes. So does that mean we can never have, uh, you know, is it, does it mean that it's unrealistic to have volumetric teleportation in the future? I guess not. Um, a couple of years ago, we've been thinking about the exact problem, right? So um, if you think about Star Wars, you know, Princess Leia gets teleported and, you know, I did not see any depth sensor or volumetric cameras around her. Um, although I didn't even see a single camera either, but I think it's probably fine if, uh, if we assume that consumers will have a single camera in front of us because this is something that is already, um, everyone is already having that, right? So I'm using a webcam in front of me to talk to you guys. So a couple of years ago, we started working uh, in collaboration with UC Berkeley, Waseda University on how can we do, how can we digitize an entire 3D person in from a single uh, photo? So we introduced this method called um, PIFU, which stands for pixel implicit, um, uh, pixel aligned implicit functions. It's a representation that allows us to digitize an entire 3D per, you know, human with clothing and texture from a single photo, right? So you take a photo, segment the background out, and then use a <clears throat> deep neural network that has the ability to generate a 3D model. So one of the insights here is that, first of all, I mean, you could do use a voxel to do that, but then the resolution is limited because it takes a lot of space. So instead of using a voxel, we use an implicit surface representation. The second thing is, um, the other thing that we found out is if you use a global feature vector, then uh, you end up having a problem that it's sort of like encoding the entire thing into a single uh, feature and then generating that will basically not have enough variation. So one thing that we found out is that the resolution was still poor. So in order to still have a high resolution output, what we did was we sort of like ensure that there is a better connection between the output and the inputs that we're using. So instead of using one single feature vector, we basically use per XY coordinate, a feature vector that basically still takes into account the entire uh, input image, right? So we use this concept of pixel alignment between the internal representation and the input data. And we use a uh, fully convolutional network for that. And what we've shown is that from actually very few training data. I think it was just um, in the scale of hundreds of 3D scans uh, with some augmentation of data based on an input photo, we can actually generate this 3D model of the entire person. So the network is imagining what the back of the person looks like. So these were our first results, right? So you can see that it's not bad, right? So even with people holding an accessory, I mean, it kind of looks like legs sometimes, but it still looks like it's doing something. The initial work took um, a minute to actually generate a single um, 3D model. And one of the bottlenecks in here is basically you have to sample um, the entire space, the entire volume, uh, because you have, you're using an implicit surface representation. Now, <clears throat> this is a problem for real-time volumetric teleportation because it's not real-time. So one of the things that we've shown later on um, it's uh, this method that we have presented at uh, ECCB uh, last year and uh, also um, at SIGGRAPH Real-Time Life where we won the uh, you know, Best in Show Award uh, is this method that makes this whole thing real-time, right? And um, there are a couple of uh, tricks here. One is a lossless method that is based on a octree representation, which obviously reduces the amount of sampling that is required. Uh, and the other one is uh, a heavy engineering of you know, different scheduling methods so that we can use multiple GPUs to actually um, do this in real time. So what we've shown is that it's possible to do this in real time uh, using very expensive GPUs. Uh, so I think we use the GB100 for that, but 
what's really impressive about this method is that the only input is just a Logitech webcam. It's not even a deck sensor. And we put it in the room and any room, and it has the ability to uh, create a full 3D representation of the person in real time, including the texture in the back of that person. So that's sort of like, uh, you know, one of the first methods that use a single view uh, approach to digitize uh, an entire person for volumetric teleportation, right? So here you can see another video where you can see the person is rotating. Um, and uh, we've also shown an end-to-end -end system where this can be streamed over Wi-Fi onto an iPad with uh, AR capability, right? So uh, you can see I move the, air, the iPad around and I can see the other person. So the way you can imagine that is that on the other end, I have another person either with an AR pad or with like an AR glass, I can basically um, see this whole thing in 3D. So I think this is really, um, you know, a promising step for something that, you know, hopefully we'll be able to see one day, uh, you know, a future where, you know, people have the ability to either interact with each other or interact with an AI agent um, that feels like that person is actually there, right? And I think there's really a huge amount of different applications where people can um, use these kind of technologies, but right? not only for education, for training, it could be used for companionship or all, all kinds of things. Um, but one thing that you see here in the, in the movies is that people are saying that, you know, it's actually floating in the air, right? Like holograms. And um, I think the idea isn't dead yet. And um, I think one of the things, I think it's a nature or science paper from uh, Brigham Young University uh, presented recently. It's an approach that actually uh, uses lasers and particles to actually produce a, you know, sort of like a form of hologram. Um, I think it can even have color. So I think there's a, a lot of things that are happening in the space, uh, which makes me, um, uh, you know, very optimistic about, uh, you know, the ability to actually see this one day. In the meantime, uh, as I mentioned before, I think that um, consumer AR glasses are probably coming, um, you know, I mean, we already have them, uh, but I think they're probably going to be more mainstream in the next uh, five years. So this is certainly a form that, um, probably we'll see uh, the use of these kind of technologies. Um, so more recently, we've been looking, starting to look into um, applications that are relevant to virtual and augmented reality, because I think this is the space where um, digitization um, and, and capture makes a lot of sense. Um, and trying to think beyond just like virtual humans, but what about entire scenes? What about dynamic scenes? And one of the things that is really important in any AR VR application is the real-time aspect of it because it's not an offline rendering. So we've, been, we've recently introduced a method called uh, planoptries. Uh, it's actually uh, a word for planop planoptic octrees. Uh, it's a wordplay. And it's sort of like a new representation that allows us to um, store neural ra radiance fields, right, nerves, um, inside a new data structure that allows us to render in real time. So this, so this is something that was just presented, and it's kind of going to be presented um, this week at ICCD, um, where you have highly complex um, scenes, lighting conditions, material properties that can be rendered uh, in real time. And it's almost independent of the complexity of it, right? So pretty much a volumetric representation of uh, a scene that doesn't have an explicit storage of it, right? It's kind of like a neural representation, even though Planoctries actually tries to remove the need for a deep neural network inside it. So let's start with nerves. So what are nerves, right? So nerves is this super hot field right now in computer vision. There's really an explosion of papers here. And the idea is that you have a set of samples of an object. So for example, multiple inputs, uh, multiple views of a, an object in 3D. And uh, you can basically train a neural radiance field representation from that. And you can basically re-render this from arbitrary views. This is different than a 3D scan because the 3D model and textures aren't explicitly stored. 
Um, but what you have is you have a deep neural network that is compressing this into just a few megabytes. And basically uh, you have the ability to render from different views and still uh, preserve few dependent effects. So the way it works is very simple. Um, you basically have a position and a direction that you take as input into the deep neural network. And then you can basically generate a color and a density. And in runtime, what you do is basically shoot array and then you aggregate the density and basically obtain, um, obtain a high quality rendering from that. So in order to make this real time, uh, what we do is we introduce this method called Optin trees that is using an octree based representation and samples the space um, of each uh, 3D cell and aggregates um, spherical harmonics for each of these space into a color, um, right? So the combination of an octree and spherical harmonics to basically compress few dependent effects allows us to do this real-time acceleration. And one thing that is nice here is that you can see this is given an object, we basically have this octree representation here. And um, we can have an extremely, you know, it's about, I think, 3,000 times faster than uh, standard nerves. So it's extremely fast. And uh, we basically preserve all the, um, or most of the view dependent effects uh, from uh, these um, objects, right? So. Uh, we also have the ability to alter the lighting condition uh, in real time. So you can see we're basically moving around uh, various parameters and you can see all the natural lighting. So what's interesting here is that there is no 3D, there is no explicit 3D model of that object. It's literally a volumetric, an octree space that has some spherical harmonics and we're just sampling from that in real time. Um, what's really nice is that we can also easily in integrate an actual CG model inside that scene. So it's compatible with other CG object. And just like any kind of volumetric representation, you can render volumes very easily. So what's really promising here is that, you know, I've been showing a couple of uh, examples with, you know, complex objects with, you know, complex material properties is that you can actually render entire scenes. Like you have the, um, it really doesn't matter like how complex the scene is, but you can basically put an entire scene in there and it still works in real time. Right? So you can um, have multiple views of a conference room, you can have this museum piece. And what I think is the most promising part is of this technology is that if you think about virtual reality, the only form of realistic 360, you know, panoramic views you have are basically just you know, everything that was captured from a spherical camera. So you only have, um, you know, you don't have the full six degrees of freedom to walk around the environment. You only have three degrees of freedom for rotation uh, to view around that environment, but uh, you don't have <clears throat> anything that allows you to walk around. So obviously this is something that is um, really promising in this direction. So the big thing that I can see with the use of nerves is that we can finally have you know highly realistic scenes that can be captured and can be also viewed in real time with six degrees of freedom the limitation though or at least for now is the question on how do you capture those kind of scenes because now you can actually have a little bit of notion but what about walking around the environment uh what about um well how can you <clears throat> have a proper way of digitizing entire environments without uh, you know, artifacts, especially for materials that are very difficult to capture. So not every kind of material is equally easy to capture and store. So those are like the immediate problems. And obviously in long-term, we'll be looking at problems such as dynamic scenes, right? What, what if you have dynamic 3D content that you want to be able to display and render in real time? for a augmented and virtual uh, reality system. So feel free to uh, go. So this is a project that was uh, led by Anjo Kanazawa and also Alex Yu from UC Berkeley, and also with uh, collaboration with uh, Rilong, uh, Matt uh, Tenchik, and also Ren Eng.
So feel free to go to the website and you can actually try it out inside your browser. So just go to that website, click on one of the models and you can test it <clears throat> without the need of a, of a GPU, just works on your CPU and feel free to uh, play around with that. So with that, uh, I would like to thank you all for listening and uh, I'm ready to take questions. Thank you. Okay, thanks Ha uh, for this very wonderful talk. And uh, now we uh, enter into the uh, the the, pan, uh, the the short Q and A session. So I think uh, this is um, uh, I do have a few questions. I hope the then the, the, the audience like um, YouTube also have questions. So uh, first of all, so for the first part, right? So you talked about this uh, 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 faces and humans, then and, and then. Then you talked about the 3D scenes. Uh, for hey, faces and humans, right? So there, there are two, um, I, I think there are two challenges. One challenge is about the training data, right? So uh, do, so I, I'm asking this from your perspective, do you think there are grand challenges in terms of uh, getting uh, better training data or how, what is really the impact of having better training data on the performance of the system and how we should tackle those? Right, <clears throat> so the obvious way of tackling this is uh, twofold. So, so to answer your question, first of all, the, train the training data impacts highly the, the, the outputs. Um, mm. the, the more the high quality the data you have, the more balanced it is, the better, right? And that mm. is actually one big thing on how to get that right. And I can tell you that a huge amount of focus that we do at Pinsuit is on, that, on the data, right? Mm. The, the data conducting the experiments, the, the, there's a huge effort there. Mm. So there are multiple things to accelerate that. One is we can use synthesis itself to mm. uh, generate data, but then mm. you can only synthesize what you can really control. So let's say, can you control whatever you synthesize to be a neutral front-facing face? That is the case, then you can do that. And we do that. We actually show in the paper how we do that. Mm. Um, the other thing is uh, synthetic data, right? Mm. How to use, there's a new work actually from, I think Jamie Shutton that is, uh, you know, using, I think entirely synthetic data um, for, you know, digital humans manipulation. But we also use heavily uh, simulated data, right? Simulated data in the sense of use computer graphics um, to, you know, render as many situations as possible. But one thing that is, Kind of difficult with humans is not just like the face but it's like everything the hair the environment the lighting mm. okay um so another uh, question is about this kind of uh, fairness right so fairness uh it's a huge issue for for ai based the uh, systems what is your are your thoughts on this sorry i didn't understand uh, fairness issues a fairness right? so, yes, yes yeah uh well, so what, what yeah, I think fairness. Um, so I, I, I assume you're talking about um, balanced data sets yeah, yeah. and not being biased toward uh, a specific uh, race or a specific uh, age. Mm. Um, well, I think there's something quite important there is that in order for us to be successful first, it has to work on anyone. Um, and mm. it has to work on a wide range of populations. So somehow by... <laughs> By uh, default, we have to ensure that it works on a wide range of people, right? So it's mm. not like um, face recognition performance where let's say it only works on Asian faces well and not on other people. <clears throat> um, here, what we, what the product that we're trying to build, the output is something that's visible. So if it doesn't perform well on a specific ethnicity, then the whole thing is not gonna be successful. So for us, it's extremely important to actually have um, highly balanced data sets and also to get those um, to get those right. Okay. So the third question is related to humans, right? So I have seen your works on this uh, reconstructing this kind of photorealistic animated faces, not just a single face, right? From, from videos. But how do how about this kind of humans, right? So for example, like a uh, so you showed uh, uh, results on a single image, right? A single image. How about the video? 
Do you think that that the what is so sold on that? Do you think that can help like also single images, right? Because you have this kind of temporal coherence. Yeah. So actually, um, the method I just showed you actually also works on multiple images, mm. um, and the reason for that is that it's extracting the um, extracting the identity feature from that input image, and mm. you can actually take multiple ones and aggregate them together. Mm. And uh, we have shown internally that, I can remember if it was in the paper, but we've shown that you can take a front and a side picture and you basically, for example, would get the nose better. So there mm -hmm. might be some ambiguities from the front that you can't see mm -hmm. the depth, but if you take from the side, you also improve that. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we know. And obviously you can also take a video in, uh, in addition to that mm -hmm. um, in order to improve the quality. But I think that, um, there is also more challenges that come in. For example, if you add video, you also want to be able, you want to be, I mean, you have more data, but that doesn't mean that you just put all the data to, together and you get automatically a better result. You need to have a better, an algorithm that has the ability to, to handle that. So that's obviously something we might look into the future, but mm. um, so I'm not saying this is a good or a bad idea, but at least in terms of the needs, for us right now, it's it just has to be fast. And mm. I'm kind of still sticking with the idea of things has to be as good as possible, has to be as simple as possible, just like taking a photo of a person. Mm. So that's sort of like our primary focus. Okay. So I have uh, one technical question and one, uh, one non-technical question. Okay, so the, also the, the technical question is about the 3D scenes, right? So in, in the last uh, part of the talk, um, so I think for, for that, uh, I see two uh, challenges. One is uh, how to represent 3D geometry and material. Another is on the simulation part, right? So be, be like the rendering part. Uh, so in the deep learning era to, to, to really get to solve this problem, which area is the most the critical, most challenging, right? So the, the rendering part or the modeling part, or both of them are challenging. It's hard to compare, <laughs> like two different problems. <laughs> It's hard to compare which one is harder than the other. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm pretty sure uh, I don't have an answer. I cannot have an answer to that really quickly. But um, so what is hard about the modeling part is. Because it's a very large scale thing, right? We have to, in particular, for example, run, running that um, on like a mobile device, right? We have to, to, to sacrifice something, right? So uh, I think that probably, you know, it's, it's kind of like one is from the real world to the, the you know, the, 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 the virtual one mm. where you have basically the, the, your internal representation of whatever object you're doing. And then you have the rendering, which is you're trying to put it back on, you're trying to render back onto the screen. The, rendering one um the problem the challenge for the rendering part which is for example nurse is um uh, is the complex is is the if it's if you're going beyond just like one object right if you see entire scenes right if you've seen it so there's a lot of work that people are doing right now in that area um the other one is also the material itself right so what if you have um, highly reflective materials. What if you have, um, you know, things with a lot of transparency? Those are things that, <clears throat> even though they've shown that nerves can do, but it's not entirely perfect. Mm. I think for digitizing things, it's more like the generator uh, mm. part of deep neural network. So the generator, well, you need to train a very powerful generator, right? And then obviously, mm. um, how do you, what is actually the output representation? If you already constrained with a mesh and uh, certain, you know, ways to represent appearance, then you're already limited. Okay, so I have a non-technical question it's related to education, right? So I think how you are established the researcher in this, where we established in this field, right? So for example, if uh, a new student want to enter this, right, the face, this kind of, human, like 3D scenes, right? Or for example, like, uh, for example, you, I, I guess your company is also recruiting, right? So what is your suggestion, for example, like what is really the fattest path to, 
doing cutting edge research in this area. Like, I think like, right. I yeah. I, I I think I maybe have an answer for that. So, I one thing that has changed from the past, maybe when we started research, is that there is a lot more resources on the internet right now. The a lot of the programming is a lot more accessible, and there is a huge wealth of data that you know I didn't have back then. Obviously, that also means that more people are working on these things. But um, I think for someone to at least be successful in that area, they need to people need to see what they're doing. So I think it's probably important for people who maybe don't have access to um, you know going to the best schools or you know or want to enter uh, the best schools. So basically they can actually work themselves on all of these projects. So they can, and people open source a lot of things. So I would recommend people who are just starting into that area just to um, you know, dive into the space, look at some of the projects that they really, really like, and then download the code and play with it, right? Even if they don't mm. fully understand every part of it, but mm. start with a pet project and then start reading or attending some of these online courses that everyone makes available now there you know, better than anything I had in the past. Um, and then starting to get into that, I think having shown a portfolio of projects that you have demonstrated to, you know, develop and to work is, I think, very valuable and probably more valuable than, hey, I have this and this degree, <clears throat> I have this and this score, uh, this and this grade for this class. I think if people spend more time uh, on these, they can spend a lot of time on these things by themselves. Um, I think the self-learning part is something quite important, but at the same time, of course, the foundation you need to have build some foundations, um, and that's something that you know in school you can definitely get. But in addition to that, I think the really important part is to just have show that you have projects. So if you, you want the attention from a a prof like you know you to um, take them as a student, I think there's always the you know recommendation letters from people they work with that is very useful, but What's I think really the key that I would be looking at is what did you, what did they do right? They say I worked on this project, I did this, that part I implemented myself, um, and there are just certain things that you would know this is not something easy, and if you can do that, then um, it 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 reflects a lot from that person. Okay, thanks. So so basically, hands-on experience is very important, right? If you want to get into this field, okay? Um, that's, correct. that's correct. Okay. How do you have a uh, concluding remarks for like your recruiting, like, et cetera? Yes, please. So go to our website, pinscreen.com and go to jobs. Um, if you guys are interested in any research intern position or just research uh, position, please uh, contact me directly or just uh, send something to jobs at pinscreen.com. We'll look at all of the candidates. And uh, we just did some postings. We have really a lot of uh, candidates, but you know, obviously anyone who um, who wants to work on you know moonshot projects, really exciting projects, uh, definitely ping us. Um, <clears throat> we we do publish, we do collaborate with uh, academia, we um, also have um, a strong uh, we're also part of a strong program with DARPA. So um, very cool projects that I think um, just bring me if you're interested to learn more. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Hal, for, again, yeah. for the wonderful talk. Very, very wonderful talk. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. 